so since um, this conversation is about cities on cities right and cities are the drivers of our economy uh, and they are also at the heart of culture what you what i realize as an architect is that they hold layers and each layer uh, of history in a city is modern for its own time so now that they become uh, a new habitat and everyone seems to want to gravitate towards them because of you know economic opportunities uh, we realize that it's important to address environmental complexities and i think the only way to really address them is through is by addressing cities you know over the next couple of decades so what drives it i mean the last few decades seem to be driven entirely by economic parameters what's going to determine our the development of cities in the coming decades i know shaja you're doing some stuff with the metaverse and what not and vin has been doing stuff in india uh, and stuff uh, in the U and and developments in the uk so is uh, i sort of address my first question to vin how's your experience been you know between these two places and what have your learnings been well i think uh if it's cities are obviously an extremely complex subject right because there's no one component that drives it by itself uh, a lot of things have to come together to shape or create or whatever so as designers and architects and urban designers you know we have a certain role to play in that but what i think understanding all the components that actually help you realize things and there are very large issues there are smaller issues but but all of them have to be taken into account to to really set a direction for the city so certain things happen by evolution as you mentioned you know there are layers and layers of cities and there are certain principles i think that stay almost constant they don't change but the 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 sort of trends and the the uh, issues that we all have to deal with do evolve over time so i think uh, as as you mentioned economics is always going to be the driver whether it is today or tomorrow or the day after because without that you don't have the investment that is required in the city whether it's a government investment whether it's private investment whether it's uh even even public investment but all those factors are critical to under to be and to understand what is involved how everyone needs to come together to have a vision and then try to execute it i think my frustration usually is that a lot of times we look at things in in a silo in a, in a one particular component and in the end there are a lot of studies and thinking and so on but really they don't get implemented because things move on and by itself they cannot be carried through so i think whether it doesn't matter whether it's india whether it's uk whether it's us whether it's uh, you know any other major cities the fundamental issues of whether it's connectivity and transport and and creating urban places and and spaces all those are fundamental principles that i think historically have been there and they'll continue to be there and as long as i think everyone understands that we are a small portion contributing to that bigger overall vision uh that should that should help so lately i think just answering your question more directly in the in the going forward and has been now for at least maybe a decade the response to climate response to i think covid made a huge difference and accelerated things that were happening anyway with technology and with uh, understanding of the environment and climate that today all of that is being yeah what used to be a, just an idea uh, maybe 10 15 years back today is is being driven now by users by uh, policy makers and as a result also architects and so on responding to that urgent need of the climate change that is happening and how to respond to that and it's something that i think it's going to take a lot of effort from a lot of people over time to change the direction that was set in a in a very negative way for a few decades now well um do you think uh, technology or something that it can do can can technology contribute to that change can that speed it up is there a need for um, for a sort of for a, for a faster pace now because i see i see a lot happening i see a lot happening in the world of architecture there's we're building post covid like we've never built before at least in in india but i see there is that i see that the the dialogue isn't actually progressive it's mm-hmm. maybe right it's not really progressive it's we're saying the same thing over and over again 
So is there, what I'm trying to get at is, is, is there a, is there a technical answer to this? Technology, I think it definitely uh, will continue to be important, just like economics is important. Technology does lead to innovation and ways of building. I'm not sure whether the pace of change needs to get faster. I think India is in a unique position where it's going through a huge development, which the rest of the world I don't think is at this point, including China. But evolving technology to respond to the needs today, I think is definitely, it's a great tool and it's a great uh uh, way of uh, innovating things. And I think it should be in, uh, taking sort of a major role in that. Uh, so no, yes, the answer is yes. Whether it's just to accelerate or whether it's to improve, uh, India particularly needs, India is still in my mind, the industry and construction industry and uh, and the delivery mechanisms are still quite antiquated that way. And they do need to get to a level of but even the West has not moved fast enough to keep pace with that lately. So the new technologies are needed. New, we are still using the same materials for construction, you know, in, or bulk of it, even though there's a lot of experimentation going on. But there isn't a mass construction solution yet on the horizon. Is that sure? Well, I mean, I think, um, like, maybe I'm a bit biased, but like, you know, a, a while ago, like, uh, you know, my father wrote this book called like a million cities of india and and i still believe like the wave of urbanization that india now needs and is probably seeing um which is like uh, because india is only like about nine percent or ten percent urbanized compared to 60 percent of china and close to 100 percent in japan and other places so the first wave of urbanization will be somewhat decentralized like um and you know like it will be like places like Urgao and and like these kind of smaller chunks, which are high, somewhat could be much better, of course. Like, but that's the model, right? Like that, that there are these. Uh, they don't need to be gated, but they would be these kind of chunks of development that happen as a first wave. Um, and and those, I I believe, could also be like hotbeds for technological experimentation, because yeah, there is a lot of best practice technology that has evolved like globally, like uh, particularly through China, because since the 1980s they have been the ones building most cities. Um, like throughout the 20th century, most of the West has not built any new cities, right? Like all, uh, whereas China has built close to, you know, 500 or so. And, and so that's, I think like India could be a hotbed for experimentation, like uh, an adaptation of global best practice to, to suit regional needs, uh, including climatic and sustainability uh, aspects, but there's a huge social aspect, right? There's upskilling. Uh, aspect for the construction industry, which China managed like extraordinarily well. Like, like even with the with the phone, you know, you wouldn't make a phone anywhere outside of China now. Like, it not not just because of the the cheapness of labor, which they no longer are cheap. Like, but just because they're the only people who can make phones, like, and make semiconductors and so on. So similarly, it, it could be that India can have use its position of like in in some way, like moment in time. Uh, to to become like the, the kind of exporter of technology which has been proven in, in in the diverse landscapes of India, like economic and social and geographical, and and the next wave like after India is Africa, right? That that's that's like maybe one percent urbanized, like and that's or three percent, something like that. Like and um and so I think like the million cities of India, like like decentralized growth uh, is going to be a very useful model, like globally, I would think, like uh, even here in the UK, like uh, or in the US. You know, some states like Texas and um, like there's a lot of building going on now in Austin and Dallas and so on. Uh, so all of these, I think, will benefit from decentralized technologies of construction. And, um, and and that also allows us to adapt to local conditions a whole lot better. So I think so. Yeah, technology is needed. And like and but it's, it's a matter of adapting global best practice that's already evolved and been researched for the last 60 to 70 years all the prefab construction aspects, uh, which didn't actually work out, not because of technology is not there because of like other procurement problems, right? Like the construction industry is extremely fragmented and every state has its own laws and like, and, and um, so yeah, the technology is there definitely, but like it, it requires like the, the kind of demand side, uh, which India has like uh, to, to motivate further adaptation and, and um, you know, evolution, like rapid evolution that China supported in the late half of the 20th century and even now, and India could be uh, the next uh, next hub, you know. 
So in I, your studio, no, sorry. No. Now I was just going to make one one comment that uh, you know part if you, you know, if you really get to the root of the issue, and I think Shaja is mentioning about you know creating new cities and decentralizing and so on, and and there's a lot of discussion on that that makes a lot of sense, particularly in a country like India with, with you know one point three or four billion people. The, the problem, I think, is just building new cities by itself is not enough if you can't build them right. And and so if you get to the fundamentals of that, uh, right now the framework in India is still it's driven less by uh, policy and direction and, and so on. Uh, it's driven more by the economic interests of the private sector. Whereas China was able to do it because it was a lot of it was driven by the the policy side from the government. Now they didn't build necessarily the best cities, but they did build them at least. Uh, in fact, overbuilt them, some of them. Uh, the the thing with India is that it's always driven by short term interest, which is you know unfortunately how the private sector works, uh, and that's why you end up with a Gurgaon, which was probably one of the greatest opportunities to be in a, a showcase to the world is pretty much a, a pretty a showcase in a different and a negative way. Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with that. In, 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 just to, like, I mean, I'm not saying that Gurgaon is like a good role model, but like I do think if, if the economy is naturally steering in, in that direction, there is some wisdom to, to it, like that we can somehow build on and make make the Gurgaon model better rather, um, rather than, I don't think like India can do anything like what China did because we are we are a very diverse country, and mm -hmm. uh, on top of it, like we are a democratic country, which I think is a great strength yeah. and like aspect of resilience. Um, and like my interest in a decentralized city building is is from a democratic angle, right? Like that, uh, it, it, if we can crack that egg, like you know that that's going to be like hugely um, a product that can we can export from from India to to elsewhere, like um, democratic way of building cities, like that. So, so I think one of one of the points to add to that, and then I'll let Akshat uh, take over. Uh, the you're you're right that the model you can't just keep on rebuilding the existing infrastructure and existing city and just adding more and more uh, densely to that. So decentralization has to occur. Uh, but again, if there was a policy, you know, if you go deal with the fundamentals correctly, whether it's the infrastructure, connectivity, public transport, and and a, a vision for the place, and then steer the energy towards that. One of the advantages of the current technology and actually post-COVID and even the cultural change on how people work and, and technology allows them to work somewhat from a distance now, is that you can create those communities and you can create them probably much quicker. Otherwise, it would have taken ages to, to create those new communities. Uh, but somewhere along the line, that has to be driven that vision has to be created and driven because and bring all the people into the fold to to get a good result at the end. I just want to, if you don't mind, Akshat, go back to yeah. what you started with. And I think because I'm probably the only non-trained architect on the screen. So maybe the way that I look at cities or try to kind of make sense of what what they are to the people who inhabit them at this moment might be slightly different or coming from a different lens. But when I think about the idea of a city, I always go back to the fact that it's very etymology of politics is actually about cities and governance. And that's the etymology, the Greek etymology of the word politics. And the cities from the beginning, but more so today, are tied up in a web of extremely different kinds of politics. So one is, of course, the governance, which is the electoral or who rules. But the other thing is also when you think about politics as someone having the power to decide who gets what. So whether it is within a household, within a family, or it is in a, at a neighborhood level or a city level or a country level, you know, it's there is when somebody else gets to decide who gets what, it is politics. And I think those two meanings of politics come together in a city all the time. And they're mostly at loggerheads and they clash. And within your initial framing also, Akshay, when you were talking about how cities are, you know, hubs for culture and they drive economy. I think all that is true. I'm not debating that. But I feel like it's also important in today's day and time to also acknowledge their role in causing the kinds of problems that we either have with the economy, with capitalism, with the cities. I mean, in a city like London, I've grown up in Lucknow. I lived in Hyderabad and I lived in Bombay. I've lived in Delhi. Now I live in London. And there is one thing which is while they're extremely diverse in different cities, both in their aesthetics and probably their planning and their you know, running. But one thing that I've seen as a common thread across these cities is that none of them are inclusive or accessible. And while these issues started from the beginning, and while we are today having all these conversations about the idea of the city, I feel like 
you're still not really able to hit the nail on the head and maybe it's not possible to but how do you kind of address these problems which emanate from a city and where city is at the core and the heart of those problems and of course i mean when you're talking about future cities i'm sure you guys are the experts but you could think about cities which a city like london or delhi which is already established and how does that kind of slowly change or transform into something better but on the other hand you also have i think within india itself there is this plan of these super cities or smart cities some 72 of them which are supposed to be built from scratch in a clean slate and the two two kind of contexts offer very different challenges and opportunities so what is the way to go about probably when you're starting from a clean slate how do you not make the same mistakes again because the, whether it is the cities in physical space or the cities or places one builds in the metaverse i feel like as long as the same people will continue to hold the power to define who gets what we will keep recreating the same problems so i do not know what how do we go beyond that and as, as architects akshat probably even you could respond to this how do you feel not just your individual practice because these problems are so big that they're not going to get sorted individually but what is it that really needs to change so that's exactly why you chose the non architect <laughs> um, with questions the very principles of our conversation or the fundamentals of our conversation well look does i think um, what you're raising as an issue is 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 pertinent and and i think i i think most more often than not architects talk about um development as technocrats but we always talk about people right i think it's the people conversation that's often left out of focus at least when we communicate amongst ourselves and and i think partly when the communication goes out to people does architecture and planning need a communication overall and you've been doing that for on on the behalf of of designers and uh, and artists for a while i have never done communication for architects designers or artists well, i'm a journalist I, and my job I, has been to question them and review yes. and critique their work yeah that's exactly what i meant so you have sort of um, you've been in that position right and you sort of set up this huge digital platform for all of us um and and that's what i was trying to come to that do we need to start communicating differently even amongst ourselves do we need a different method of uh, you know of of talking to each other do we need a different vocabulary for us to be able to have a more meaningful dialogue with with the people in a city uh, well, i would say yes and these are the conversations that i think we a lot of us are having on the other side that how do you break away from these disciplinary silos which keep people different and so in fact when amit who's the founder of stir when he founded it the very idea of stir was that's going to be a platform that operates within the realm of architecture design and art largely the umbrella terms within the creative universe and we don't want to be an architecture magazine or a design magazine or an arts magazine because enough of being in echo chambers and it's really important in high time that we kind of blur these boundaries create intersections but more than that contaminations and the moment we you know step out of these spaces and start interacting with people of different not just creative disciplines but even the community the people the user who are going to use the city or use a built piece of you know architecture it starts changing i think uh, an expert's very own understanding of what their practice is about and what is the kind of impact it has and i was just reading a really wonderful conversation that we had uh, uh, with an architecture critic yesterday where he talks about the arrogance of architecture in thinking that it can remake the world and it really you know sort of uh, stuck with me because a lot of conversations and i listen to a lot of them you know within architectural sort of groups and domains are so much about how we going to save the world and how we going to you know fix all these problems and i always feel like that there is this perceived hierarchy you know which exists in general within the practice and the practitioners that we are going to fix this while we are the ones who created this and something sorry before i think when i and shaja you should kind of jump in here to you know say something about this but i feel like for me i feel like it's so important that everybody is taught humanities i do not think any of the architecture schools teach critical theories feminist theories you know humanities subjects as part of the curriculum and unless you really study sociology how are you going to design a city i feel like it's so important to start making that change from the education itself if you want to impact the practice yeah so samata i think the two or three things you raised i think just to comment on that is you're correct on the fact that there is call it arrogance of architecture partly because either the society thinks that way and then the architects believe it that somehow they can solve the problem of the city is just by building a building of some sort uh the other thing also correct is the schools don't really teach enough in fact st- schools tend to reinforce the view what design is or what architecture is and so on in a very sort of a narrow way depending on very i'm i'm 
saying in general, but there are schools that are much narrow and the others that are a bit broader. But And the third thing also is correct, that if you don't have dialogue between different stakeholders in the city, whether it's politicians, whether it's policymakers and, and, or, or the whole communities, you can keep on adding more and more people. If you don't have that uh, communication between them, it's a way of educating each other about some of the issues. And that, therefore, it makes it a very complicated process. But then cities are complicated. And there is no one-liner solution to it or any single professional who can actually do it without uh, uh, an effort which is where everyone comes together to work towards the same goal. Even to define the goal is not easy in, in, in that sense. So yeah, you're right. The question is, how do you really, and that this is a tough one for everyone, that how do you actually create that uh, environment where, the, where you're educating each other and you're, you're learning from each other whether it's in school, whether it's professionally, whether it's uh, in your in your day-to-day uh, uh, -day work. So you actually understand the needs. A lot of it, people will do it, but it, it, it it's very superficial. And it doesn't work if it's only superficial. So does competition have defined the goal, Shajan? Well, I mean, I think more than computation, like these problems are so, um, you know, multi multidisciplinary and then also mul uh, multiple stakeholders right including experts and non-experts and so on like and i think that the first two 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 solutions two main threads for uh, seeking solutions is like one is digitalization right like that these problems are complex they're non-linear they're like beyond the capacity of an individual architect or even a group of architects or urban designers or experts or of any kind like um so uh, so we need digitalization of like both the the, the design and the delivery process, like uh, urban design and its physical manifestation of uh, cities. Um, and so the other aspect, which is uh, kind of orthogonal to it, is is democratic uh, or aspects of democracy, right? That whether it's uh, you know we we don't elect any of the planning, any of the people that like influence our lives, like, like in cities, right? Like cities are kind of determined by a central planning body, which we, we in no way can um, elect or remove, like, and there's no real uh, measures of success uh, or, or penalties. Uh, so that so the electoral aspect of, of democracy in, uh, in, in cities is, is also important. Um, and there could also be like, like in Switzerland, other, you know, direct democracy where you vote on specific aspects that affect you. Um, uh, but not always, right? Like you shouldn't be able to vote on like things that are happening in Manchester if you're sitting in London or some part of London uh, voting on other parts of London, right? Like, so there must be some gradation of direct democracy aspects. And then there's also participatory aspects, like how much can you actually participate in determining um, uh, the future of a given area in which you live or work uh, and so on. So there are all these aspects of democracy, which like I think broadly also includes the inclusionary aspects that um, Zamta mentioned, right? Like so, so, so there are these aspects of democracy, and like one 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 other aspect which I believe is needed is equity, right? That um, and equity, I mean literally owning something in the in the, in a city, because uh, right now like the biggest chunk of or the any any way you can the only way you can own equity in in a city is to buy land, right? like and buy property and that is outside of most people's capacity uh, or financial wherewithal uh, but there could be other ways to have equity in a city like so for example if you're one of the early movers that go into an early uh, development like and you 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 invest your effort or expertise or financially like then you should somehow benefit from it right like and hong kong is a classic example of such a um, uh, such an economic and political organization where like if even as late as 2022, the city was able to issue dividends to its citizens. Like each citizen got like five or $6,000 Hong Kong dollars at the end of the year. And so I think all these aspects of um, democracy are super important, like an, an orthogonal to that is uh, digitalization. Um, and so in some sense, like these two aspects, like I fully believe like uh, are instrumental in, in, in determining solutions to all the complex problems that um, sometimes we may raise. Like uh, there might be other aspects, but I do feel uh, digitalization and democratic uh, processes and true democracy, right? Like not like some kind of um, 
corrupted electoral politics, which you know, which over time, like as they get larger, tends to 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 deteriorate. Right, and that's that's where I will return to the idea of city state or something that Samta raised uh, about politics, like coming uh, the source of the word coming from the city aspect. Um, and city and citizen, like all, all related, right? Like the, um, so, I mean, I do think like the idea of city state is something that like we should take more seriously, like because um, only one percent of the wor world's surface area is composed of cities, and about eighty percent of the global wealth is in that one percent of land, and so, um, and, and and similarly, about like seventy or something percent of global GDP annually is in in that one percent. Uh, and, and then furthermore, like, you know, 70% of the world's population is going to live in cities. So, so the idea of governance uh, is instrumental and is going to be hypercritical. Like, and so the way, if we can come up with a democratic way to govern ourselves and govern our cities, like uh, along these aspects of individual rights, uh, about stakeholder participation uh, and equity, I think uh, we, will, we will make a lot of ways, uh, strides in solving, solving these problems. I, I think just adding to that, I think that definitely that is uh, the process that Shadi outlined is, is, is very much correct that that will help. One of the hopeful uh, uh, view right now, I think, which I found uh, you know after decades now that is driven by the user, I think what, the, what is it that can push people, force people to think that way? And the interesting thing that's happened in just in the last little while is that you know, we all talked about climate and environment sustainability for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years now. And slowly it was catching up and it was becoming more real rather than just a discussion. But lately it's getting driven by the user now. So it's not the government or the 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 developer or the architect, but the users has started to demand certain requirement. I mean, the office buildings now, ESG is probably on the prime sort of, you know, question that everyone raises. And that's really never happened before. It used to be more about location and the building and sort of, you know, how uh, interesting the, the facade might be or whatever, the different aesthetic criteria and so on. But now that has become an important component. So I'm just on the hopeful side of it, because all the other issues are very, can be very depressing, actually, is that if the user drives that and that adds to the what Shalya was saying about it's a democratic process, but driven by the user itself. Uh, that then can change the industry, and that push it creates the economic force, pushes the policymakers to then think about it, and then it translates sort of you know goes from that user all the way up to whoever is creating the the framework for that, and people start to plug into that, and that's how I think that's the hopeful sign right now. What's happening? And when I, where is this happening? Sorry, I missed it. So it's, for example, office users, you know, post-COVID, uh, let's just go through that, dwell on that a little bit. Post-COVID, a lot of the employees kind of disappeared, started to work from home, didn't want to go back to office every day. Uh, so the office, uh, the comp corporations and companies have created their uh, policies now to promote the economic, social, and governance issues, uh, providing amenities, providing uh, uh, sustainability, the building's uh, requirement. Whether they understand or not, I don't know, but they definitely ask for the ratings and so on, that it meets the highest standards. You're looking at reuse in the building, reuse of carbon, You know, not creating a lot of carbon in the building. So all that is, at least in Europe, and even in US to a degree now, it's happening. That is the push coming from the office or corporations that employ a lot of people saying, listen, we will only go to the best building that meet the best standard today. And I think just in the last two, three, four years now, the market had to respond to that. And market had to say, well, listen, otherwise we cannot rent the building anymore if we're going to build it. So that creates a force. Now, it hasn't happened that much in the residential side yet. It's only in the office because that's where the most stress was. But it's uh, it's it's uh, definitely a recipe in a way that if, if the user starts to be become educated and demands certain things, if not, we're not really going to buy or live or do this or that to a particular environment. That's the course I can see helped by technology, given that that information now can be transferred. You know, two decades back, it was very difficult to share the views, but now everyone has can have access to that view. 
So when you combine all these things, but drive it from the user side, I think to me, that might be the recipe for achieving what we're talking about. Right, and it's really interesting uh, that you said that, uh, and because I was also thinking about a lot of these conversations that we have about the idea of well-being becoming so prominent within workspaces, a workspace yeah. design, right? So, and this is a shift that, in a way, naturally, organically got caused because something as major as a pandemic happened, which shifted the ways in which we operate, you know, in our daily lives. But it's also making me think about something really interesting. You said that we are often like asking architects about their role and their responsibility in, you know, yeah. making changes happen. Uh, but the moment you cite an example like this, you actually also put the responsibility back on the users. And which has also been one of the greatest challenges of any democracy, that an inactive citizenship leads to the failure of democracy. So if you're talking about mm -hmm. any kind of democratic processes to kind of change the way our cities are built, how we operate, work, function, live, it is important that there is an active participation that happens from the user's side. However, I don't think the problem was that the users didn't want to be active, in, in the case of a city especially. It is about the fact that things have shifted in a way that people are listening, are willing to listen to what a user wants. Because, um, I mean, this example of the post-pandemic shift in the works, work, workspace environment is because people got used to living at home. They did not want to come back to, you know, uh, work every day, especially people with families or little children, especially people who do not have so much of domestic support, you know, to, to run their homes when they actually go to work. And, and since the pandemic was so long drawn that it almost became like a new way of being and living. And hence there was a resistance to go back for most, even though I did meet a lot of people, especially the ones with family who said that actually our workspace is our respite. That's where we can get away. So we do want mm -hmm. to go back. And that also put this pressure on the, on, the, on the people who own or build these offices to create more inviting environments so that more and more people want to come back to work to find that respite out of their homes and this work from home situation. Yeah. But I think what's really interesting here is to keep these conversations like that. Don't shift the blame, but share the responsibility to speak and to listen actively from both sides. And I'm not sure yeah. there are enough and more forums who do that. But if I have to ask you as someone who runs such a major practice in terms of, you know, also its size and scale, you spread across, across different cities. How do you inculcate this attitude of listening within your teams? Yes, I think it's it's obviously I think it's only a starting point. It's just that till now there was there was almost the leverage was all with one group, not with the other. And as you said, the user really was whatever was offered, they could have it or not have it. Uh, for for the first time that I know in the last whatever fifty years that in in, in the industry that it's sort of shifted and it's given that leverage to the user in some way that no. This is what life should be. This is how living should be. Uh, I can have balance in my life both ways. I can go to work or uh, typically what's becoming is now almost a three-day work week and two days you work from home for a lot of uh, industries, not everywhere. But all that is a result in a way happened maybe by default, but also the technology allowed that to happen. And and today you can, you know, genuinely say that you don't have to go to the office five days a week, but you can still do the same work that you do and you can meet your other uh, life responsibilities and so on and have a more balance. But that creates the, the, I think the leverage got shifted to the, to the user. And it hasn't shifted, as I said, in the in the living side of it, residential side of it, there's shortage of housing and you can grab whatever you can, you get, you can get your hands on. But I think if, if, if it somehow can happen both in all components of the city, whether it's living, whether it's work, whether it's recreation and so on. Uh, I think that might be the only way that it will get achieved because architects and the politicians and, and corporations also have to be told what is right. Otherwise they'll keep on telling you what you should be, you know, living with. So my question is that because architects are really like in between, you know, of this owner stakeholder and the user relationship. So, and since these are the things that we believe in, in terms of positive shifts that we want to bring about. So how as architects do all three of you think that you can bring about this change in which a user is heard more and has more of a voice and a say? I think, I think we're all already talking about a people planet approach, right? You're talking about, uh, we've been talking about development for people for the longest time. And then over the last couple of decades, We've been talking about the planet as well. Um, when you really start to start looking at it, you're saying, con who's controlling this? How are you controlling resource consumption or resource utilization? And maybe it's time to start thinking about a new 
way of determining this or, or allowing this, right? So to move to a, you know, maybe a utopian idea of a resource-based economy as opposed to an economy that's just based on, uh, on, on money to drive consumption. I, I think like, you know, last time I said like digitalization and, and democratic processes as, as some kind of key framework to think about how to come up with solutions. And I, 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 I believe one of the ways where architects can actually put that into practice, uh, which is why we are uh, also very much invested in this kind of online world creation, uh, like whether you call it metaverse or like, you know, we're very much invested in gaming technologies um, on the one hand, uh, as much as like advanced CAD, uh, CAD technology developments, right? Like which on the one hand, expert level software development and technology development, uh, you know, brings the benefits of customization to, to save material, like, you know, so you can, customize building elements to uh, to be structurally optimal, to use as little material as possible, to waste as little material as possible, and so on. So these are all expert domain things that are enabled by a digitalized process, right? And, and, and the digitalized process also allows for these advances in technology to be put in front of the user through, through video gaming platforms. Like, uh, I mean, the worldwide, there is about like 3 billion gamers, right? Like, and the world population is about 8 billion. And so, and that number is only going to keep increasing. So, when we are talking about people like, like the next generation of, like these eight billion, uh, are going to be digitally native. Like they, they're going to be used to the internet like at like light speed. They're going to be used to um, a blurred boundary between what's online and what's physical. Both are real, obviously. Um, so, so we've been very much interested in using gaming technologies as as a way of encouraging participation and there can be many kinds of participation right most users don't really want to participate on every every little thing that goes on in the city even though we might like to think that they do but most of the time they just want things to work right but they do want mm -hmm. to have agency when it comes to bigger decisions um you know so so it's a kind of agency of the investor that's where i think like demo democracy is also a large part of incentive design you know like it's not just giving people a right to vote but like how do you how do you design incentives so that uh, people feel a certain kind of agency, but also feel that they're going to benefit from it in one way or the other, right? Like so, so if so, this idea of alienable rights or fractional rights, like which New York in many ways pioneered, like uh, in the 1800s, like these ideas of air rights, for example, that you can sell them, like that keeps transactions at like a kind of potentially at like a peer-to-peer. Uh, level as well, like, you know, so you can make local transactions like that affect your neighborhood without the involvement of any, uh, you know, federal level involvement or even city mayoral level involvement, like, um, and London itself, like, also has this strange, um, or has had some version of this kind of uh, street rights and, uh, you know, permitted development rights and so on, like that, you can make certain decisions without ever involving, uh, you know, planning authorities and so on. But that I believe we should improve the scope of that. And, and, and in all of this, like, I think video games are going to be instrumental, uh, like uh, to, to educate, to also return civic pride to the built environments uh, by just walking around. And it's also going to return a human aspect to the city design, which is like human eye level experience, which, uh, which if you're walking around in a virtual world, like uh, you, you will definitely want to see things that are interesting, not just boxes, right? Like that. Um, and, and so, uh, and there's a history for this as well, like, you know, SimCity, like, had enormous influence in the way, like, a lot of urban design is thought of, like, and it has resonance with people like Jane Jacobs and, uh, you know, we'll talk a lot about eyes on the street and these kind of things, like uh, Greenwich Village in New York and so on. Um, so, yeah, like, I do think, like, video games can, on the one hand, like, absorb a lot of advances in the, in the scientific and technical ad advances in uh, CAD technologies and physical digitally manufactured um, construction technologies. Um, and on the other hand, also bring in users uh, to, to have a more active engagement with the, with the built environment. And potentially they could also, you know, have more, more than just a voice. They can have actual capacity to invest uh, into, into a development. Like, you know, if you have like 10 votes, for example, like the idea of quadratic voting, so on every issue, you, you can spend all 10 of your votes on like one issue or like distribute the vote across three issues you care about. Like, um, so I think, so there can be innovations in democracy. Like it's, we shouldn't think about democracy as like static from like given from the Greeks, right? Like, it, like there is 
when it comes to political economy of the built environment, like there's a lot of innovation possible, both on the spatial technologies, but also the governance technologies, yeah. That's a very different way of- Unite both of these, like. That's a very different way of thinking about the influence and execution compared to say what uh, you would do in it. And, and I think in that sense, there may be an overlap with, uh, yep, sorry. Well, I think I think what Shade is saying is uh, I think you can put the two together in the sense you know what I was referring to is that there are certain fundamental principles which I don't think are that much debatable, uh, but uh, which is you know what what really the end result what constitutes a good working living environment and as a result a city, and that's the balance between whether it's workplace and living. Well, that's the 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 Jane Jacobs model of you know streets that are the eyes on the street, build the communities, combine certain communities, connect them uh, well, and that creates the, the city that allows you to move and, and have access to all the culture and everything else that you want, why people come in the city, which attracts talent to the city. And as a result, once talent is there, then the, the employers go there. And, and in fact, just picking up on what I said earlier, you know, in Texas and, and Florida, for example, there's a lot of growth and movement, a lot of uh, things are happening in the US. And and it's driven, yes, by technology companies. It's also driven by financial companies. But there's a, there's an economic reasons for that also that their taxes are low and the companies decide, well, I'm going to move from high tax state to a lower tax state. And therefore, and the weather seems to be good and I can get talent there also because there are better universities and so on. So it's all those issues come together that to define why a city works a certain way. So the principles, I think, can be, I think if everyone can agree on the fundamental principles, then what Shadi is saying is a really good way of taking it to execution. Uh, because technology can help you a lot in giving you that next step. But the but first step to me is still is that whether it's politicians or whether it's the users, they have to come to some sort of a common understanding of what is, what makes a good environment and a good city and a good place to live or work or whatever. And that understanding, I think, just to add to that, needs to come bottoms up because it's been top down for way too long. Well, you see, this is where, you know, as architects, you end up with always this challenge, right? You have a responsibility. I'm now taking to a much smaller scale than a city. You, you can have a home to design or building to design or whatever at, at an individual project. And you end up with two responsibilities in a way. What is it that the client wants? And you need to respond to the client's requirement. And but sometimes the clients don't know themselves either, right? So therefore you have to guide them. You have to offer them either options or alternatives or a different way of looking at it and they can react. And they can react and then convey what they really like or they don't like. I think that to a degree in a way you, you multiply that thousand times and you're into the city environment because sometimes you have to put those options and discuss and find that have people agree on. But that's where I think the responsibility maybe the architects can come up with is that they are the ones who put not not as fixed ideas, but as ideas that are true and tried and tested and put the, educate the user and let the user then respond to it and give the feedback and give and say, this is what's workable. And, and you take it from there. Maybe I can plug in, make a plug for an experiment that we're, we've been trying to do for the last five years. It's still kind of, uh, it's making little headway like uh, for various um, political and economic resistances. But um, so this idea of bottom up, um, development, like I think the minimum unit of experimentation is something like a homeowners association, right? That, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not an individual house, but it's also not thousand, thousands of houses. Like, mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're, we're thinking like a chunk of like 25 houses, like, like 20 to 30 houses. Like, and so can we put this into practice? This, um, like this confluence of governance technologies and, um, and spatial technologies, right? That, um, and governance technologies include, include how you kind of, manage the voting system but also you know some some amount of like automatic um uh, yeah how do you say so, something like similar to to the bitcoin governance right like you you, you stake you have some stake in in, in all of the uh, so it's kind of so there's a aspect of staking and so on like in, in these governance aspects but like apply to the built environment um mm -hmm. so we, we we built this like video game based configurator where like users potential buyers of a of a home could first log in and like choose their site in 3D, not just a plot of land, but uh, pixels of uh, in 3D voxels, and then cusp and then occupy those voxels uh, with the house, or they just buy the voxels and leave it there, like the idea of air rights, right? That um, 
And but this process, like we discovered, like people were inviting like their friends, like uh, they, um, and we discovered what the market wanted, right? Like in the in a group of fifteen to twenty buyers, like most of them wanted like you know houses that had like two uh, two bedrooms and not a three bedroom one. They wanted a bookend house and and not uh, anything in the middle, obviously because if the site is beautiful, so they want views and so on. So all of these things like was enabled just because like we developed a system which combined like actual physically realizable designs uh, and put it in a game engine and like put it online. Like, and so people could just log in and click click a few buttons and like see who their neighbors are, which is very important in a homeowner's kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to build a true community and not just um, a bunch of owners, like um, you want to know who lives where and uh, and what they're buying and what you can share with them and so on. Like, so this experiment we've been trying to get off for the last four, uh, four and a half years. Like, and so now the client actually has built a, small micro factory on the island of Rotan, which will, uh, which is also, uh, you know, upskilling the local construction labor uh, to use robots and like digital technologies. Uh, and once the houses are configured and like somebody orders them, we can hopefully build them using this micro factory. Um, but I mean, it's it's come a long way, like, and I we genuinely hope that like, you know, it will be successful or some version of it will, somebody will pick up and like try, try elsewhere in Africa or in India or whatever. <laughs> So like, I do, I, I really agree with Santa that it has to be somewhat bottom up driven as well. I mean, along with the top down political will and so on that like, and the, the lowest unit of bottom up development is like something like a homeowners association. Like, and, and so, mm -hmm. and you, if it is successful there, you can expand it to like, you know, apartment buildings, like, and, and like, you know, rows of towers of apartments and so on, which seems to be the popular mode, uh, not only in China, but also in India now, like, um, so it could potentially be co-designed with the eventual users and and the and the financiers of, of, of urban development like or residential development in this case yeah. so who are your neighbors determines the city to some extent right that like it did, I mean you go to a city to to be in close proximity like why, why do people go to Silicon Valley like there's nothing exceptional about the Silicon Valley itself, like as an urban environment, it's horrifically bad, but uh, but there is a proximity of congenial, uh, you know, talent, right? Like the, the, uh, so, and the cold start problem in cities is very much about, you know, sympathetic businesses and people who, who positively reinforce each other's skill, right? Like, so that's why Shenzhen is the kind of electronic city and, you know, like you, you need that initial audience of, of, or citizens like that share some common um, yeah goal like which is it could be healthcare it could be uh, technology you know tech cities fintech cities um, but, but also Shadi, Soto, like in London you know it was like a kind of cultural hub like where all the game uh, or, or the movie industry was located and and so yeah like the cultural problem and the central place theory are like highly integrated right? like you, you want to have a density of something in in, in a city. But, but Shadi, I think I was just going to comment. If you look at, but if you now start to distinguish not just cities, but more successful or preferred uh, living environments, you know, cities like New York and and London and then Paris or whatever the major cities, which are, you know, why are they more attractive to people as compared to, you know, they are the principles again coming down to, you know, it's it's the density is more coherent, they're more walkable. They're, they're diverse economies. They're not, a, you know, Silicon Valley, for example, is so much driven by uh, only the technology sector, right? But uh, but if you look at even LA, which is still very spread out and a car-oriented city, but compare that to New York, in terms of efficiency of a city, I still think New York is better than most other places uh, because you have communities within, you can walk, uh, to work, you can live if you can afford to live there. That's a different issue. I'll get to that, but but you don't, uh, and and you're well connected to everything if you choose to uh, work a little further away. There is a certain efficiency of city to combine all those activities and the energy that it produces. I I think is still a better model, I, uh, in my mind at least, than uh, than the. But but you, what you are right is that yes, the beginnings of a city do happen with some major single economic driver. 
that yeah very that, much so and i agree with with you like i mean the ultimate goal or or, or the attraction of larger cities <clears throat> for sure is the agglomeration effects right like that there's a urban economy of like diverse diverse industries is not a mono industry which is also extremely fragile like detroit got wiped out yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the large part because of it, it's mono focus uh, mono industry focus but uh, but obviously like so the, when cities start they are starting as localized economies right like you know like either they're a car manufacturing thing or they you know they're, they're small cities in czech republic they're entirely centered on on making parts for bmw or others in, in germany mm -hmm. like and and so um and, and also in the u.s like a lot of like small towns like 50,000 100,000 people like they have pretty high gdp you know they're somehow connected to texas instruments or like uh, so yeah, they they start out as these like localized economies that are highly congenial workforce uh, live there, um, uh, and this is, it seems to be a global phenomenon. Like even in Japan, like you know, like there's a Toyota city of like thirty thousand employees of Toyota, and once mm -hmm. you have a Toyota city, then you have like other congenial businesses that come along. And and uh, but yeah, you're right. Like over time, like for a city to be thriving across centuries, it has to diversify. Uh, and and attract like a broader demographic than just one kind uh, but like the pioneers of most cities have to be uh, like kind of localized on one thing like either it's a port city or it's a tourism city or it's like some kind of kickstarter of, a, of the localized economy and, and mm -hmm. Chicago is maybe one of those interesting cities that made the leap from being a kind of small city along along on the river uh, and then it quickly became the hub for culture and even high rise building and like, you know, hub for architecture. So it's so, yeah, I, I, I agree with you that it, it definitely the hope is for a diversified urbanized economy. But it, it does, for the large part, I think, start with the localized economy. No, and then in fact, fact, in fact, sorry, one I'm of the going to stop you for a minute. I think Santa has to leave shortly. So I'm going I, to also, ask I also need to leave shortly. So uh, I'm, going to direct one, I'm going to ask one last question to each one of you. It's the same question. What do you feel are the guiding, guiding principles to achieve this? And sometimes I'll start with you. Mine would probably uh, be very vague uh, to interpret directly, but I think it's important as the basic underlying aspect of anything that designers do, and that is empathy, which goes beyond the human, the non-human, the more than human, the post-human, you know, all forms of the human and beyond. I feel like empathy is should be at the at the foundation of any kind of a creative production. Right, Shade. Yeah, I think I like I would summarize it as you know the two somewhat orthogonal um, axes of like governance technologies and uh, spatial technologies, and 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 to think it more simply, it's one is like digitalization of the entire design to physical process. Um, and and the other is how we can govern cities in a in a broadly democratic way, which includes freedoms uh, of the citizens of, of of the city. Yeah. So governance technologies and spatial technologies. And that leads me to winning. Well, I think I I would maybe of the of the all the issues say that somehow we need to find a way, uh, a to communicate, but also to educate. Uh, uh, and define the goals to do that. Now, whether we use technology to achieve that, uh, I think uh, a lot of the points Shadi made they may you know give hope that that's a possibility that one can. But until we bring people to some common understanding, uh, all the process democracy is messy, right? You can end up with many different ways of doing the same thing and people arguing each other, and it can become quite negative as well. And it's pretty fragile that way. I mean, looking at the US right now, it looks like a very fragile econ you know, country that from that point of view. So dealing with it in day-to-day -day life of people, uh, the, a lot of the esoteric things need to be, I think, put aside and some of the basic fundamentals uh, to be discussed. People need to get educated, agree on. But, but I think after that, there is probably hope to be able to achieve something. But just ideas for the sake of ideas, I think, unfortunately, don't lead anything. It's like all the smart cities and everything that was raised without defining what really they are and how you get to that uh, doesn't really lead to result. And, and it just becomes something that after a while, people only ignore it and just move on with their life. Yeah, I'd say for me, it would be, you know, for a people planet approach would definitely be changing 
finding a way to change the patterns of consumption and mm-hmm. uh, resource utilization. But um, thank you guys for taking this time out. It's uh, it's been wonderful to have you, and I will call you all shortly after this and bother you again.